So I didn't, in the last five years, 47 Felicis backed startups have been acquired by firms such as Google, Facebook, Twitter, Groupon, Microsoft, AT&T, Disney, eBay, Intuit, and others. So that's quite an impressive track record. Tell us a little bit about your selection process and what are the most important things you look for in making an investment decision? Yeah, no, I really appreciate it. It's so funny. I mean, you know, that's kind of a moving thing. I wish we could add 47 IPOs to that. You know, we're working on that. We had secondary IPOs. Um, you know, I, I think the, the more important things is, you know, throughout six years of doing this, um, one of the things that we found is one of the most important thing is kind of the DNA uh, of the founders of the company. Um, some people refer it as it has to be a hacker or technical founder. I see it more as a product visionary. Uh, there is somebody with such an acute vision of a product, wherever that is, or service, uh, that definitely uh, fulfills a very important need. Um, as much as we'd like to talk about traction, uh, doesn't have to be that, oh wow, like I get it now, there are 10 million users, but even in the very beginning, uh, there is some sense of like why that product is gonna matter and how it's gonna be different. Uh, when I go back and look, that probably has been one of the most common factors uh, among founders, this kind of uh, obsession with building something that is really, really awesome. Um, and, and then if you ask me, well, how do I define that? And you know, one of the ways that I thought it in my head uh, of the best way to capture it is 10x rule, right? I mean, there are a lot of people uh, that I think have great ideas, you know, they're building great companies. But as I mentioned in the previous panel, like these days, there's just so much information out there and so much noise. Like something has to be 10x better. It has to be 10x faster, 10x, 10x better, 10x cheaper. Um, without that kind of a drastic difference, it's very, very difficult uh, for something like that to, to succeed in the market or let alone for that success to be uh, long term. And then the last thing is the critical use. Again, I, I might just repeat the example that I gave before. But the way I think about it in very simplistic terms, um, it's the same thing for me, right? Why, why do I exist? Like, why do we have this venture firm? And we need to constantly prove that if we disappear tomorrow, would there be a loss? And what is it that we're doing different that is needed in the market and that fills a hole or a niche? Um, and we have to earn that every day. I think we're humble enough to know that um, it's not a static target. And I think it's true when you're in a startup. Great. Um, so you've publicly said that you invest in the best founders and startups, irrespective of stage, location, or valuation. Can you talk more about this, and are there a few specific examples you can give that highlight this? Um, absolutely. I mean, um, first of all, I think it's a couple things. Uh, in terms of data, uh, we are fortunate enough. I mean, most people don't have a portfolio that has 47 companies. We have 47 exits. Um, I really like it when like, money that goes out actually does come back, which is very rare in the venture capital industry. And one thing that we realized out of that is that more than half of those deals were not cheap deals. They were actually expensive deals, uh, expensive valuations where a lot of other investors might have walked away at the point we made the investment. Uh, and, and clearly we have established by fact that you know, high valuation doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be a negative impact on the outcome for the company. The second thing is, look, we have a different approach. We are very humble people. You know, we work very hard to get to where we are today. We don't have the arrogance to say somebody walks through the door in a meeting, we know exactly what success is, define that, right? I mean, I also learned a lot of valuable stuff. I, I did things that I regret, would have done differently. It's great because learning is awesome if you can put it into action. So I, I do think that at the end of the day, the way to look at this, especially the venture capital business, is actually very simple, right? Think of it as an art gallery business. Uh, it's basically a curation. Uh, I can tell you like 20 things that you need to do right, but essentially it comes down to one single fact, and that is because we are not creating these companies, our founders are, we are defined as the founders we pick to back or partner with, right? If you pick the best founders, no matter what you do, you're gonna do great. And um, the most important thing is to be able to get that right. Everything else almost doesn't matter. I could be coming out with like 10 step way, becoming a great angel investor, 10 things you should watch in a company. It all comes down to being authentic and finding great companies and great founders. And we found that there is no borders to this. There is no um, limited market. Sure, there are a lot of great people and companies that are coming out of Silicon Valley. We've gone as far as Finland, you know, Nashville, Tennessee, Canada, Brazil. We haven't found anything in Antarctica or Nigeria, but I'm surprised if like some you know, crazy stuff wouldn't come out. In fact, we were just talking about a payment system in Africa called M-Pesa, 
you know, Western systems still haven't gone to the efficiency of that product, and it's been developed in Africa first. So I really do think that talent and innovation is global, and that's why we feel in order to be able to have the best shot at, you know, finding what we call the iconic companies in the world, we should have, we should have uh, this approach that is different, and that just means that we want to work with the right companies for the right reasons. You know, not, not caring about valuation, not caring about stage, and not caring about geography, because we feel that those are all artificial constraints uh, that sometimes lead people to the wrong conclusions for the wrong reasons. So you talk about um, the best founder. So what, in your view, is, uh, it makes a, a founder fall into that? You know, it, it's so difficult. I mean, again, like I said, we like to remain humble. I mean, we've seen amazing people do amazing things. Um, a lot of times taking no for an answer. Um, a lot of times having such a sharp, acute vision of something that's going to work that when you, when you say it, uh, and the way you say it, and the way you're convinced that it's going to work is infectious. Uh, it gets other people moving. And the reason that's important is not just for fundraising, but for you actually to be able to build your team. Um, and by the way, it's true also for venture capital firms. I mean, I was a sole uh, investor. Now I have a team of six people. Um, I think if I didn't come across in a way where people are like, we're really excited about the way you're trying to do this, I don't think we would ever have a team. So I think that message is pretty universal. Got it. What are some of the most common red flags that you see when evaluating a startup that just completely turn you off to, to investing? I mean, I think it's, it's kind of hard to generate in terms of red flags, but things that I would say is kind of a negative factor for us, things that are incremental, me too, uh, somebody that's trying to be the 10th company in a space. A lot of times, I think where we put a lot of value is uniqueness and creativity and novelty. Um, the second thing is, again, having talked about the immigrant background, there's something about a founder that has overcome hurdles. Um, we did too, so uh, that basically shows us that, you know, uh, contrary to popular belief, even at Google, we didn't have a straight path to success. We had zigzags, we had dangerous moments, we had moments where things have turned the other way. I know it's crazy, like, you're like, how could that happen? Look at the company now, but I was there early on. Uh, I installed servers in a server room, like, I've done, like, I, you know, I was in the kitchen, you know, helping food dinner for my colleagues, like, I've done everything along with sales and other stuff. But um, I think it's really great and refreshing to see something in a founder where they have overcome adversity before, and, you know, that confidence that it inspires in you that, like, nothing is going to stop them in what they do. So every investor has had certain deals that they passed on, and in retrospect, they wish they hadn't. Um, can you share a few examples of this or what you've learned from a few instances? Yeah, I mean, look, um, I think one of the most humbling things for me, just, you know, just to tell you, so we had 47 exits, and I said it was roughly $3.3 billion in enterprise value. If I told you the companies where I could have invested but didn't, um, that probably is maybe easily 2x that. So on the one hand side, I can tell you a success story. And then on the other side, I could probably pitch you the other side. I'm like, why I'm a terrible investor and all the like crazy failures that I had. I mean, it's very humbling, right? So um, there were a couple opportunities. For instance, there's been one instance um, where we were, I was talking to Twilio. And you know, Jeff Lawson is a great founder. He's a tough guy. And he was a tough negotiator. And there was one point where I'm like, this is just insane. Like, I don't want to deal with this. And I let the deal go. And it turns out that a lot of times, when I look at some of the best founders we work with, sure, most of them, we have great DNA. But what makes them really good, tough, also makes them unique personalities, which means that they're not going to agree with you. They're not going to be easy personalities. Sometimes you might even think they're crazy or berserk or something. But that quality makes them uh, break walls and make things happen. So uh, probably what I learned is that a lot of this stuff like due diligence and analysis is overrated. I think you just need to get the big things right. I mean, just to tell you, when I started angel investing, I, it was just after YouTube, and I thought, I am just so stupid. I missed this big trend. Look at YouTube. I'm never going to find a great company. And then I thought, well, what else can I do with that? And I realized that video monetization is going to be important. And I invested in three companies. Two of them went public. The third one is probably going to either go public or get acquired. And literally, I had no rocket science, no due diligence, no crazy like formula of picking these companies. I just picked the Warren Buffett S team, right? I mean, I asked my wife, you know, when you look at some great public companies, my wife was one of the early customers of Lululemon. You know, a lot of the stuff that she loves as a product turns out to be great performing stocks in the market. 
all this kind of concept of we need to do due diligence, look at lists, run numbers, spreadsheets, models, nothing is as impressive as having an amazing product where the first thought that comes to your head is wow, this is amazing. Like I love this product, you can't take this product away from me, you can't take this service away from me. If you're investing, I hope you come across that. If you're building companies, I hope you can build that. Um, and that is timeless. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for a question or two. Hello. Uh, you keep mentioning Canada, and I'm actually Canadian, and I was just wondering what type of industry are you specializing in and what part of the country is specifically? So we now have three investments in Canada. I would be surprised if we don't have more uh, in a year or two. So we have Shopify in Canada, uh, in, uh, in Ottawa, uh, and then we have Interaxon and Top Hat Monocle, Top Hat, called Top Hat now in Toronto. Uh, we have looked at companies in Vancouver. Uh, unfortunately, we're not in Hootsuite. Um, one thing is, I hope um, I was pretty clear on this. As much as we have positive biases about countries, I think Canada has some unique elements. There are some amazing people there, some great technical schools, great engineering talent because of the way education system is. Um, and it creates great companies. And it also happens to be a country where you have really great people and a pretty sparse VC industry. And it's very difficult for people to get funding as a result. You have amazing companies bootstrap themselves. Um, if you ask me, like, hey, what are we doing something that's specific to Canada is that, look, I mean, our next success can come from a completely different country. Um, as much as we had great experiences, we're not just thinking, like, hey, that's a rule, and you know, um, it's going to turn into kind of a self-fulfilling uh, uh, process. But it did make us appreciate that more and invest in Nothing speaks louder than you know, our investments there. They're kind of our best advocates. Um, and we have seen to be a great formula. And um, there was great stuff coming out of, out of there. And I think it's, it's awesome. Great, thank you. Um, please join me in, in thanking uh, Aiden for his time. Thank you.